Which war? In Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam. The conference, ladies and gentlemen, was about World War II in the Pacific and how warmongering Marines had victimized the long-suffering Japanese military. And the conference, by the way, needless to say, was financed with your tax dollars. During the 2008 campaign, now First Lady Michelle Obama said that because her husband had a shot at the White House, for the first time in her adult life, she could be proud of America. At the same time, the future community organizer-in-chief described Middle America as teeming with bitter clingers. Those who, in times of economic hardship, cling to guns or religion or antipathy toward people who aren't like them. That's what America means to the President of the United States, a nation of gun nuts, religious fanatics, and bigots. In 2009, speaking on foreign soil, Mr. Obama was asked if he believed in American exceptionalism. The president tellingly replied, I believe in American exceptionalism, just as I suspect the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. In other words, what the president was saying is that objectively, there's nothing special about America. Maybe I missed something, but during the Second World War, was it the Greek army that fought its way ashore on Normandy? No offense to our British friends, but without American sacrifices during the Cold War, Britain would have ended up the smallest province in the Soviet Empire. It's time for Americans to speak out once again, for a nation of sheep to become a nation of eagles. Submitted then for your consideration, ladies and gentlemen, what it means to be an American from the perspective of one American. I am an American. After God, my highest loyalty is to this country. I believe that America cannot remain one nation unless it is under God. America is no accident. From the beginning, we had a destiny. We couldn't have gone from 13 backwater colonies clinging to the Atlantic coast to the greatest nation on earth in a little more than 220 years without the guiding hand of providence. I believe religion is the foundation of liberty, morality, and representative government. The First Amendment was meant to protect religion from government, not to make religious people pariahs in the public square. The so-called doctrine of separation of church and state, words, by the way, which appear nowhere in the Constitution and would have confounded the Founding Fathers, this concept isn't used to separate church and state, but to separate government and Judeo-Christian morality. I believe in the United States Constitution and in the system of government it established one of limited powers, inalienable rights, a balance of power, and ordered liberty. I believe that the Constitution can only be amended as specified therein and never by an activist judiciary. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no more a right to abortion in the Constitution today when there was a right to slavery in 1857. I believe in the right to life from conception to natural death. It is the duty of a state to protect innocent human life. Legalized abortion is the beginning of the unraveling of a social order. I believe in the free market system as both the most 
efficient way to provide for human needs, and the only economic system compatible with human rights and human dignity. The free market is as American as our Constitution. It has brought unparalleled prosperity to this nation and opportunity to its citizens. Advocates of big government detest capitalism for its impartiality. In place of a system which rewards hard work, ingenuity, and risk-taking, they want rewards based on race, gender, and of course political pull. I believe in limited taxation to pay for the constitutional functions of government. As government takes more and more of our income through taxation, regulation, and inflation, it robs us of our time, our labor, and ultimately our lives. I believe the rich have as much right to their property as the rest of us. A system of taxation based on envy, one that penalizes the most productive among us, ends up retarding economic growth and is a denial of the equal protection guaranteed by our Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, it took us 234 years to accumulate $13 trillion in national debt. Thereafter, it took exactly, exactly seven months to accumulate the next trillion from June 30th, 2010 to December 31st. For the 60 years before 2008, federal revenue averaged 17.9% of gross domestic product and spending averaged 19.6%. With a runaway ideologue in the White House, we are now spending 25% of GDP and collecting 15% in taxes. As an American, I celebrate America's heroes and heritage. If you take nothing else away from my remarks today, ladies and gentlemen, please remember this. For going on three centuries, America has been the greatest force for good in the world. Ask the penniless immigrants, my grandparents among them, whose descendants achieved success in every field. Abraham Lincoln spoke of the mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land. We must reconnect those chords so that they can sing again. I believe political correctness is killing our country. National security, law enforcement, and social stability are now subordinate to group sensitivity and spurious claims to equality. Scrutinizing passengers who are most likely to commit terrorist acts is decried as racial profiling. Recognizing the reality that married couples, men and women, do society's vital work is said to offend those who think that marriage is two men and a kumquat. Political correctness has become a national suicide pact forced on the American people. I believe in public service, not career politicians, those who primarily serve themselves at the public expense. The idea of an individual holding elective office for a quarter century or more is obscene. It's hard to say which is more of a threat to representative government those who crave political power so much that they cling to it with a death grip, or an electorate so feckless that it repeatedly gives it to them. Edward M. Kennedy represented Massachusetts in the Senate for 47 years. 
longer than most of his constituents had been alive. There he sat in Washington, like some bloated, decrepit pharaoh, surrounded by his pyramids, monuments to the welfare state built by the toil of tax slaves. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, as you consider the legacy of Senator Kennedy, know that we'll be paying for those pyramids for decades after his death. 